Yes. Even though we're just checking into lab, we still wear our lab coat, right? Since we're entering lab. Lab coat. Well, uh, directions uh, say that you actually don't need it during check-in. Okay. You need safety glasses. Lab coat required next week. Any last questions before we get started, guys? So we were doing hybridization. Where did we end up? We, were, we did SP3, SP2, SP. Uh, and SP hybridized out of has how many P orbitals? One. SP hybridized atom has how many P orbitals? Two. 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 Uh, SP geometry, which is set by hybrids, is what? Bond angles around an SP hybridized atom. All that stuff is there, yeah? Okay, guys, good morning. Happy Friday. We're off on Monday, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I was make good use of your weekend. Possible quiz next week. Lab next week. Solubility lab. Instructions are in your lab manual for pre-labs. You have to have a pre-lab. You cannot have your lab manual in lab. Uh, you, you can have it. You can't work from it. You can maybe occasionally look at it. You can't be standing there working from your lab manual. You have to be working from your lab notebook. Um, please read directions if you have questions, please ask. Uh, then we have lab report for the lab. Please be reading that. Please be prepared. Next Wednesday, our next meeting, we'll see what type of questions you have going into lab next week. Um, okay, let's get going. Any questions right now? About my lab. The other Friday lab, we'll talk some this afternoon and we'll do some lecture after check-in. Um, see you at 2.30 upstairs. Okay, this here, this page showed some of the better drawings and what, what I uh, attempted to do. For example, particularly when we had P orbitals coming out of the plane. Um, so you'll see these in your book, hopefully they look right. Uh, two carbons, sp2, we got a sigma bond here, head to head. And then the p orbitals, which are really sort of in the plane. I was trying to show this as the plane, and then and those are, well, this hybrid is sort of flat in that plane. You've got to kind of orient yourself what they're trying to show you here. And you have these p orbitals overlapping. Now, don't, this is not two pi bonds. I just said it twice because you got overlap here and overlap here. It's one pi bond though, right? Um, so you got to understand the architecture of your molecules and your hybridization here. And then the sp, uh, one hybrid between the two atoms, and then you got two p orbitals. I'm sorry, two pi bonds. Um, one of them is actually in the plane. You've got two P orbitals like this overlapping. But then you also have two like this overlapping. Orthogonal to each other, perpendicular to each other, 90 degrees to each other. Um, okay, here we go. Shape of the orbitals. I, I drew one where an S and a P. We talked a little bit about that. Here's an S and a P. It doesn't make sense unless you were comparing them relatively, looking at all three. Okay, the sp is shorter, this hybrid. There's the back load, the nucleus being right here. Okay, uh, these are my fancy drawings. Why is it shorter? Percent s character. Okay, 50% s. This is a hybrid. It's somewhere in between the two, just like a child is a hybrid of the parents. It looks a little bit like both. Sometimes a child can look a lot like mom. Like it got more mom DNA there for some, something, you know? Well, here it's 50%. The, so it's, in terms of energy, it's actually right in between the two, in terms of also of energy. 
this guy has less S character. It's only a quarter S and three quarters P. Less S character means it's going to be less rounded. This is more S character, more rounded and thus shorter. This is actually more P character, 75% P. More longer, it's, it's almost, it's closer to what a full P is. A regular P would just be sort of like this and you'd have the dumbbell over here because you wouldn't be mixing anything. I'm not, and I'm not even talking about the size of the back loop. Let's don't go there. Uh, percent S character, length, but also energy. Which is the highest energy orbital? Highest energy orbital. This one, right? Percent S character is 25% S. More S character, lower energy, right? Doesn't S sit below P? Right? S is here, then you go to P. The more, it's, the more it looks like an S, the more it's, it's lower energy. And that's important because electrons in low energy orbitals make stronger bonds. So let's see that length and strength down here in this table. Uh, this table came from another textbook. Um, we're dealing with all carbon compounds now. We'll apply this to other atoms. <coughs> Uh, the hybridization in both of these carbons is that, both of these is that, both of these is that. Bond angles around the two carbons, or, or any bond angles here are 109.5. Bond angle between three atoms, HCH, that bond angle 109.5. Any of those, 109.5. Let's look at the length of the CC bond. Okay. We've got to be careful. This looks like he's talking about the CC single bond. Well, it kind of is. We're talking about the distance between the two carbons. The distance, the interatomic distance is longer here. Usually bond lengths are given in angstroms. Longer. Why? What two orbitals is being, are being used to make this carbon-carbon bond? This carbon is using an sp3 orbital. And this carbon is using an sp3 orbital. And those orbitals are overlapping there head to head. Okay. What about this sigma bond? You don't really even consider the pi bond. Sigma bond sets all this. This sigma bond is made from an sp2 overlapping with an sp2. Well, those are shorter orbitals because they have more s character. So they're going to have to come closer together to make bonds. So the interatomic distance is less. These are sp, sp. These orbitals are even shorter, so it's got to come together even closer. All right? So hopefully this trend makes sense based on percent s character of orbitals used to make the bond. Uh, strength of the CC bond. Okay. Here, they're talking about the entire bonding between the two carbons. Single bond. Double bond is stronger. Everybody agree? But is it twice as strong? No, it's not. Uh, this is a sigma bond. But the bonding here, see, this looks like, what are we talking about? Just a sigma? They're actually talking about the entire bonding here. This is, if this is what? A sigma and a what? Uh, and a pi. <coughs> but what do we know about the strength of a pi compared to sigma? <coughs> pi bond's not as strong. Head-to-head -head overlap <coughs> is real good. Side to side, you may have, it may be counterintuitive, I don't know, but just take it from me. The statement is, side to side is not as good. Remember how we do the p orbitals that are far apart? Look like the, how can they even bond? Pi bond is not as strong. So we don't have two sigma bonds. We have a sigma and a weaker pi, so you get a lower number than just double. Not much lower. There's other, there's other things going on here. What if we focus just on the sigma bonds here? Which sigma bond between the carbons is stronger? SP2. 
Mm -hmm. The negative bond between the double bond would be closer because there's the overall overlap is more. Yeah, this is a stronger sigma bond. So actually, this sigma bond is is more than nine. You know, it may be, for example, uh, 110. And then the pi bond, which is weaker, maybe is 64. And these add up to 174. Okay, down here, triple bond. Is it 3 times 90? No, because it ain't three sigma bonds. It's not 270. Uh, we have a sigma and 2 pi. Okay? So again, this is counting the entire bonding. Um, this sigma, the sigma bond here is actually the strongest sigma bond shown. Because this is sp, sp. And we're talking about carbon carbon. Let's, let's look at the CH. Length of CH. Not much difference, but it's still a trend that we need to know. Longer CH bond. Why? Because that's an sp3 orbital interacting with an s. Where this is an sp2 orbital interacting with an s. The s is the same, so let's don't even worry about that. Which is a shorter uh, orbital. SP3 or SP2? SP2. Shorter. Uh, consistent with question. So, let's see, this is uh, more S character. So this will be shorter, right? So the, so the CH bond should be shorter for using a shorter orbital. Is that right? Yeah, it's shorter. But then down here, this CH bond is even shorter because now we're using sp to s. Okay? We can understand these trends. Uh, uh, length and the strength. Well, it kind of goes, it kind of makes sense. Shorter bond is going to be stronger. But also energy. Why is this a stronger bond than that? <coughs> Yes, it's shorter, but also understand that which is a lower energy orbital, sp or sp2? sp is a lower energy orbital because you've got 50% s character. More s character, more like an s, and it's lower. s is lower than p. Lower energy orbitals typically make stronger bonds. That's another thing to, way to look at it and consider. <coughs> now, electronegativity, well, we don't need to consider that here because CH is CH. There's no difference in electronegativity between here and here. Now, there may be a difference between here and here. Um, okay, can you understand the trends here using your idea of percent S character and understanding what that then tells you? Questions about this table? <coughs> How we do down here? Uh, rank bonds eight in order from longest to shortest. Which bond's longer? These are all, I'm looking at carbon-carbon bonds here. A is the longest. A is the longest. Yeah, then? Yeah, A, B, C. A is longest, B, then C is the shortest. Because C is what type of orbitals are making C bond? SP2, SP2. Right? SP2, SP2, uh, SP3, SP2, SP3. These are all single bonds, so it's, we're referring to hybrids here. Hybrids are making the... <coughs> of bonds A to C, which can rotate? Can, can bond A rotate? <coughs> yes, how about bond B? Can bond B rotate? Yes, how about bond C? Yeah. Yeah. 
Fun so you can rotate. A and B can rotate, Bon C cannot. Everybody there? Why can Bon C not rotate? Because of the pi bond between <laughs> these two? There's a pi bond here? There actually is a, there actually is a pi bond there. Uh, that's, that's resonance. Um, you guys don't see a pi bond there. There is. These two p orbitals are actually uh, interacting. Okay, that's resonance. The bigger thing is, the simpler thing is beyond that, it's a ring. And uh, rings can't rotate. Here's a five-membered ring. Can this rotate? <laughs> I just destroyed my model. Okay, that's another simple reason why it can't. And it's more of a theoretical question. You may gotta make sure you understand which bonds can rotate, etc. Um, uh, this afternoon in lab, we'll continue more with that hybridization. We'll do some examples like we did yesterday, including like uh, on the green sheet, uh, letter E, um, including we'll be looking at atoms other than carbon nitrogen, oxygen, etc. When you look at other atoms, it, it really doesn't matter that there's an end there. Atoms really don't have letters on their backs. They just have one extra proton. And since that's the nucleus, it doesn't really change anything. Um, okay. Um, A word about O2 theory, O2, molecular orbital theory. Uh, what type of theory are we doing right now? When well, we say carbon makes four bonds, oxygen makes two bonds, two lone pairs. This is really the so-called Vesper theory. Uh, valence, valence bonding theory. This is introductory theory to organic chemistry. There's another theory called molecular orbital theory. Um, just look at the structure of oxygen, O2. O2 has, is usually shown as this structure. Oxygen making two bonds, two lone pairs. Standard bonding for oxygen, right? Everybody like this structure based on what we've talked about thus far and probably largely what you talked about in Gen Chem? Yes. Good structure for oxygen? Problem is it doesn't match the experimental level. Because we know that oxygen is, has magnetic properties. It's paramagnetic. And to be paramagnetic, you have to have unpaired electrons. Well, see, everything's paired here. Long pair and bonding pair. I don't see any unpaired electrons. So, my, so that must not be right, because it's got to match reality. It's got to match evidence in the lab. Um, it's not right. That's a failure of valence bonding theory. Uh, to get the right answer here, you really need to look at molecular orbital theory. This is where you combine the orbitals and they no longer belong to each atom. Right now, a hybrid is still an atomic orbital. It still belongs to a certain atom. It's just the, the original ones have been mixed. When you go to molecular orbital theory, you end up with one orbital spread over the entire molecule. Um, so I just want to point that out. We'll do a little MO uh, midway through the course, and when you study aromatics, you'll really need to do a little bit more MO. Okay. Uh, I won't say much more than that, just a comment. Polarity of covalent bonds. This takes us into our physical properties handout. Uh, some warm up questions there, first two pages. Okay, so 
So let's look even closer at the bonds. The idea of electronegativity. Um, the bond between these two hydrogens is considered a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, that is, the electron density here is just sort of equally distributed between the two H's. On the other hand, if we look at something like HCl, all right, I'm leaving off the lone pairs. Typically, lone pairs are not shown. Unless you're asked to draw an official Lewis structure, like on a quiz or test, official it would have to be there. Um, but often you'll see lone pairs not shown. This is a polar bond, okay? Thus, that is to chlorine is greedy, okay? It's this guy, I'm the chlorine, so I'm pulling these electrons. And really, we're not equally sharing. Um, that can be shown with sort of a, a dipole arrow, like this, yeah. The positive end being over here. Uh, in terms of the electron cloud, it's sort of more like the two electrons that are sitting between the two nuclei are, are pulled more towards the chlor chlorine nucleus, right? And so it's not an equal distribution. But because electrons are more here, electrons are negative. So this becomes more of a negative end. It's partial. That's my partial, partial negative. These are not formal charges. And then this is partial plus. Um, we showed that here. Okay. Uh, two different ways to show polarity this way or with the arrow. Uh, Y'all familiar with this, yeah? And so the mo ACL molecule has a positive end and a negative end. Again, not a formal charge. All right. This is an electron uh, distribution <coughs> sort of assessment. Um, overall, it's a neutral molecule. And we still consider each atom overall formally neutral. Um, so this is a polar molecule where this is nonpolar. Uh, we need to look for this in many other molecules. Narrow down, focus in on functional groups. Your carbonyl is a very common feature of functional groups and it's polar. You see double bond O. The oxygen is more electronegative, right? Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, periodic trends. And so it pulls, it's greedy. We can show that with this. We know that the oxygen is partial minus and the carbon is partial plus. Now we, we have more than that in the molecule, but so we're going to have to assess all dipoles. We'll do that a little bit more down here. Um, well, let's go ahead. I wrote it here. What about the, any dipole between the C and the H? There is a difference in electronegativity between C and the H, but it's very small. And it's so small that it's usually not considered. It's not worth considering. <coughs> so a CH bond is also always considered nonpolar, even though there is a slight difference in electronegativity. CH, nonpolar. We'll have to look at summation of individual dipoles to get an idea of the entire <coughs> molecule polarity. We'll do that a little bit below. There's a couple of other examples. Diatomic molecule, which is more electronegative? Iodine or chlorine? Chlorine. Chlorine. Periodic trend, higher, okay. Chlorine's greedy, it pulls, leaving iodine partial plus and chlorine partial minus. Okay, so we would say that the iodine, in terms of some terminology which I'm introducing, we'll use more and more going, going forward. <coughs> the iodine is electron poor in this, in this molecule. You agree with that? Because mm -hmm. we understand the, the polarity? Uh, 
It's electron poor, but also we'll call it electrophilic. Which is different. That doesn't mean electronegative, it means electrophilic. What's electrophilic mean? It likes electrons. Okay? Something that's partial positive is going to like electrons. Because electrons are negative. You gotta be careful. Chlorine likes electrons, but that's called electronegativity. And so it gets its electrons pulling this way. Uh, we'll, we'll use these terms more. You have it in your notes right now. Water. You got two bonds. The OH is certainly polar. There's a big enough electronegativity difference. Oxygen's more electronegative. It pulls, leaving this partial minus and partial plus. Same thing over here. So the two hydrogens have partial plus. And then the oxygen has uh, negative character. How about BRCL? We skipped it over here. Uh, which one's partial plus? BR. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> bromine's also electrophilic or electron poor. Okay? Same thing here. These molecules are polar. You only have one dipole, and it, that's it. That's the whole answer. What about water? Is it polar? Yes. I got two dipoles, and it looks like they're equal and opposite. Aren't these dipoles canceling each other out? No. Why not? Oh, my structure's wrong. Yeah, this is not linear like this, is it? Because what's the hybridization of the oxygen? What's the hybridization of the oxygen? SP3. SP3, and SP3 is what geometry? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral, yes. And if you drew water tetrahedral, it would be... You wouldn't draw the next one straight down, would you? Would you? No, it'd be like this. Because we draw tetrahedral, that's 109.5, not 180. And then we have an orbital this way and an orbital that way, but these are just lone pairs. If you want to ignore this, yes, it's bent. I don't usually talk about molecular geometry. It's tetrahedral. The whole thing's tetrahedral, but it's a 109.5 bond angle. The bond angle's not right here. Okay. Um, these dipoles are equal <coughs> in terms of intensity, but are they opposite and thus canceling? No. no. You need one straight down. These two are actually creating a single net dipole this way. <coughs> Can you do any vector summation in math or physics? Okay, that's kind of what's going on here. We got a single uh, molecular dipole. Can you guys see? You ever can't see? Yell. These two only come from our assessment of, uh, based on our theoretical knowledge. This molecular dipole can be observed experimentally. You can't observe these experimentally, I don't think. Okay? Because all you can do is look, observe the net. The net is here. That is, if you look at water, this side of water has what type of charge? Positive. See, that's the positive side, right? Can we do that? I, it's just, usually when you do molecular, it's often doubled up. This side has what type of charge? Negative. Hey, that also makes sense because this has the lone pairs. They're negative. So it sort of goes hand in hand, yeah? Okay. By the way, what, what are consequences of this being polar? What can this compound do that this one can? What if you put this compound in the presence of an electric field? Would it do anything? What if you put this compound in the presence of an electric field? Would it do anything? The electric field would, would uh, in, in force some torque onto this. It would rotate it. And the minus would end up uh, with a line with the negative electric field. Okay. So that's one, that's one consequence. You talk about such in physics. Um, which compound can be heated in a microwave? 
Hydrogen or this guy? What's the physics of a microwave? It's all water, because water is polar. The microwaves, which is electromagnetic radiation, electro, electric field, the electric field, doesn't it have a wave? It alternates. As it alternates, it makes the water rotate, because the water keeps up with the field. Negative side, positive side, negative side, positive side. And that rotation is energy and it, it heats things up because it's polar. Those are consequences of polarity. But also solubility because polars, polar molecules dissolve better in polar solvents. Okay? So, you've got to know why it's important to understand polarity. Uh, let's look at some examples. We just did water, right? Vector summation, we have to sum up the individual dipoles. Do they cancel or not? <coughs> if it's polar, what's the direction of the net dipole? We showed that with water. Can you see it over there? Tell me, is the light off or on better? Off. Off. Off? off. H2O we've already done. It's polar. There we go. CO2, polar or not? What do we need first? Let's start with a structure. Let's see. Okay, CO2. You know, I just sort of know CO2. I can just draw it up there. Uh, if you didn't know it, <coughs> how do you know C's in the middle? It doesn't have to be. But the CO2 that we exhale is going to look is this structure here. Carbon's making four bonds. Finish it up here. How many advanced electrons we've got? Four. Each oxygen is six, so that's 12. How many we got? 16. <coughs> Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Good bonding. There you go, CO2. Okay, what type of dipole we got here? Before we do that, is my geometry correct for the... Yes. Really, the only thing you have to look at is the carbon in the middle, because this really has no geometry that wouldn't be set by that, because it has no bond. What's the hybridization of the middle carbon? Looks a little odd, doesn't it? What's its hybridization? SP. How many regions around the carbon? Two. Two. Two is SP, SP unless we invoke an exception with a lone pair. But carbon doesn't have a lone pair, there's no exception. It's SP. And what's the geometry of SP? Linear. 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 Yeah. It's drawn correctly. It's all linear through there. By the way, you can graph that hybridization, figure out what type of bonds it's making, particularly you guys from yesterday. Okay, dipole here. We have this. Yeah? Yes. And we have, I could draw it down there, I'm going to draw it right up there. That way, yeah. Are those equal in intensity? Yes. yes. Same atoms. Are they exactly opposite? Yes. They're canceling each other out. Nonpolar, which means no molecular dipole. What if you put that molecule in the presence of an electric field? It ain't going to respond. I don't think. I haven't had physics in a long time. You tell me. Right? SO2. All right. I want you to do the rest of these on your own over the weekend. We'll do it real quickly next time. You need to do some practice instead of watching me. Uh, finish those up. Ionics. Ionic is like the extreme. It's so extreme that there's no longer a covalent bond. Consider something like sodium chloride. If it was covalent, we'd have a nice dipole. Because chlorine is very electronegative and sodium is very electropositive or opposite of electronegative. But the difference here is so great 
that the, the chlorine just yanks your arm off and I'm over here and I become an ion, an anion. I just, I just took your electron. It's no longer covalent. It never was this. Okay? That's large. What we know is, right, from Gentium, these guys over here, especially group one and group two, they don't make covalent bonds. Because the other atom just essentially, if you think about it this way, took the electrons whenever the bonding took place or, or the, the, mo the molecule was formed. You got to be careful, though. I would encourage you guys to not call this an ionic bond. Okay? This is where the electrons, the, the two electrons used to sit here, or we could envision them sitting here. They don't sit there. The chlorine just took them, and that's how it's got a fourth lone pair, right? It's like it just took them. But now chlorine is negative because it owns eight electrons. It's only supposed to own seven. Sodium is supposed to have one, but it has none. So it's missing one, so it's positive, right? And Jen, can you call this an ionic bond? I personally hate that term. Don't call it a bond. <coughs> I would prefer you call it an ionic attraction. Because, because I see a lot of you guys who don't understand the difference between your bond. Um, a bond to me is a covalent bond. Ionic attraction is not covalent. All right, I wrote it there. Uh, what do we call such a compound? Salt. Salt? Yes. Salt. Uh, but it, also, it's an ion pair. A pair of ions. A pair of ions. Yeah. That's terminology that I would use. So I just throw that in there. Not a covalent bond, but we can mention that. We will see some ionics, some ion pairs. <coughs> there was a couple of, there was like a potassium or something in one of the Lewis structures in the workshop. I know one, one student was asking about that. Um, physical properties of organic compounds. We'll talk about two things, boiling point and melting point, and then solubility. Boiling point first. For a compound to boil, the compound must overcome all intermolecular attractions or forces which hold the molecules together. Intermolecular. That's between two different molecules, right? Like an interstate goes between two different states. Okay. If all of you were an organic molecule like uh, ethanol, 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 you're all ethanol in a flask here. If I want to boil you this sample of ethanol, I've got to get all of your individual molecules to stop interacting with your neighbors. Okay. <coughs> Um, and only then can I get an individual molecule or the sample to vaporize and boil. Okay. What we need to look at is what type of interactions can you guys be doing with your neighbors? This is a list of them, one through four, I think. They're listed in, in terms of strength. Van der Waals attractions will be the first we'll look at. It'll be the weakest. So you guys can be interacting with each other. You can be interacting like this. Okay? Real strong, we can even do some leg, okay? Now, this is not covalent interaction. Non-covalent interactions. Because if you were covalently interacting, you'd be a different molecule. Non-covalent interaction. Um, or maybe we can interact like with a, just like this. That's, that's going to be kind of weak, right? That would be easy to overcome. A little bit of energy, and we can, we can boil. <coughs> but if we were like super glued together with lots of non-covalent interactions, you're going to have to have more heat to overcome that, more energy to break those interactions. In general, more intermolecular attraction leads to higher boiling point. Because if we got a lot of intermolecular attraction, we've got to put in a lot of heat before it's going to boil. A lot of energy to break those attractions. 
What type of tractions are possible? Uh, that is a good term that I don't think is listed here. We're looking at non-covalent interactions, right? Let's look at the first type of non-covalent interaction. Van der Waals attractions. Now this has other names, at least the way I present it. Sometimes you call this uh, dispersion forces. London forces, <coughs> yeah, to me it's all the same. I'm not going to try to differentiate. Um, let's look at that type of thing. With some examples, look at the boiling point of these molecules. Um, this compound has one, two, three, three carbons. What's prefix for that? You don't know that yet because we haven't done steric chemistry. Propane. It's an alkane, so it's pro prop is three, ain. Propane, you use it in your gas grill. By the way, nomenclature, that type of nomenclature by video only. I'll send you that handout by email likely today. You can get started on that. Uh, the video goes along with the handout. Alkane nomenclature, it's on this, it's on the daily outline. Um, boiling point here. At room temperature, this is, this is boiling. It's a gas at room temperature. Pentane is a liquid at room temperature. 25 room temperature. You have to warm it up a little bit for it to boil. Higher than that. But then this guy, which is, which is branched, one, two, three, it's five carbons, but it's branched. One, two, three, four, five. These have same formula. Different connectivity. These are thus what? Constitutional isomers? Yes. The boiling point goes back down. Let's compare these two. Why is this higher? Well, the take home answer is surface area. The surface area here is this. The surface area here is this. Now, I could have maybe drawn this a little, a little tighter. Which has more surface area? This guy. Okay, why does surface matter area? <clears throat> surface area matter. First off, what's on the surface of molecules? The outer region of molecules. Electrons. Electron. This has more electron surface area. Okay. Um, first off, are these compounds polar? No, they're just hydrocarbon. CC has no difference in electric negativity. There's certainly no dipole here. And what do we know about XCHs? <coughs> also, there's, no po there's nothing polar there. Hydrocarbons are non-polar. If we had a polar molecule, we're the same molecule, okay? Um, my head is partial positive. That means your head's partial positive. But we could come together and I could flip over and my partial positive could interact with your partial negative. Or let's just say this. My partial positive source interacts with you. All right? Um, right? <coughs> we got water. This is partial negative. This could interact with what part of another water molecule? Yeah. And we'll show this on the next page. So this would be a non-covalent interaction, an intermolecular <coughs> interaction based on polarity. <coughs> well, we got no polarity here. But what we do have here is induced polarity. Um, the electrons on the outer shell can be perturbed or induced, uh, an induced dipole, um, as the molecules bump together. I'm nonpolar, you're nonpolar, but as my electrons sort of move up against you, your electrons sort of adjust and things can become temporarily polarized. You do this in physics sometimes. I think I've seen physics faculty take a balloon and rub it some and then it'll stick to the wall because the rubbing is inducing some temporary dipole. Um, and then because this has a dipole, it actually will induce a dipole in the wall. 
and you can create a partial positive and an induced partial negative and it will stick to it, okay? Induction. Here's the take home. The more surface area you have, the more you can induce dipoles. And the more induced dipoles you have, the more it's going to stick together with its neighbor. That's why it is. Now why did the boiling point go back down here? This is C5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, H1. 12, good. How do you know it's 12? Because it's saturated. And saturated for C5 is 2 plus 2, 12, right? You can count them, there's 12. This is also C, same constitutional isomers. Why is the boiling point lower? Less surface area. Because here, the center carbon is sort of buried in there. Here's a bigger take home. How can you, how can you summarize this? Branching does what to the boiling point? This is branched. Branching lowers the boiling point because branching buries atoms in the center and that reduces surface area. Less surface area, less induced dipoles, less stickiness between molecules. <coughs> Branching lowers. Here, these are non-branched. These are called straight chain, and this one's just longer, so it's more surface area. Uh, so all that was really showed below. Number two, look at this trend. This guy is 36. These guys are higher. First off, in terms of structure, this has a dipole. This has a permanent dipole. Permanent dipoles, no permanent dipole. Permanent dipoles are stronger than these induced dipoles that would come from here. And that's really the take home message. Permanent dipoles give you stronger polarity and the stronger intermolecular attraction. Because now I have a partial positive that's there all the time, it's stronger. You've got a partial negative. We're the same molecules. But I'm the partial positive, you're the partial negative. Two different molecules. My oxygen is going to be attracted to your partial. Sorry. Partial negative, partial positive. <laughs> The oxygen of, of my molecule is going to be attracted to the carbon of your molecule. Okay, like right here. <coughs> and we show this interaction, this non-covalent interaction, usually we just sort of dash the interaction. And so all these are there. This guy also has a permanent dipole. You can show the same type of thing with that. No permanent dipole here. Again, these are listed in order of strength. Induced dipole is the weakest. Dipole dipole interactions are next. And then we can look at hydrogen bonding. Guys, uh, 118, 78. This one's higher. Why is this one higher? If we look at the structures, they both are polar molecules. So they both could be could do dipole dipole interactions. But this one is higher because of hydrogen bonding. That's the statement. What is hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is just really a special type of dipole dipole. The OH is particularly polar. Really, 
this is no different from what we showed on the previous page. Um, we have a dipole here that's partial negative, partial positive. This positive atom can interact with the partial negative of another, dipole-dipole interaction. But here it's called hydrogen bonding. Because when you're dealing with an H that's on an oxygen, it's, it's <coughs> particularly strong. And it's so strong that it gets its own name, hydrogen bonding. Now you also have very strong ones um, it can include nitrogen or fluorine. Now in this setup, we call the oxygen the H-bond acceptor. Well, let's look in here. I got the dash here. H-bond acceptor. And then the H is the donor terminology. The oxygen, really, usually you want to talk about the lone pair, because that's really the, the negative portion interacting with the partial positive H. In addition to oxygen, it can also be a nitrogen lone pair or fluorine lone pair. Only these three can be H bond acceptors. But then the H must be on either an O, N, or F for the H to be able to participate and be a H bond donor. So when you look at this molecule, does this molecule have an H plus donor or, or an H donor? Yes, it has an H on oxygen. So it has a donor. And then does it have an acceptor? It's got the O. Okay, so we see that. Does this compound have an H bond donor? No. No. It doesn't have an acceptor. And it, so that compound on the right can't do the special type that we call hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is stronger than the normal dipole dipole. Since it's stronger, you get more non-covalent interactions and a higher boiling point. Okay? Um, there's some questions down here. Please try to answer these. And then also be looking at down below. Really, your answer is already here. This has a higher boiling point than this. But we need to be able to explain why. Okay. Then we got the fourth category, which was what? Ionics. Ionics. Okay. Ionics are going to be formal charges, which are going to be the, the stickiest of all. All right. Um, anything outstanding, uh, let me know. But have a good weekend, guys. Don't uh, remember, take advantage of the off day and uh, getting things together, preparing for lab. See you soon, guys. Some of you this afternoon, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.